Hey, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to part three of Control the Light. My name is Joe Brady, and we're here to cover a lot of fun stuff today. Uh, we're going to do some studio lighting. We're going to start with speed lights and work our way right up to studio lights, and we're going to get it all into control with my good friend here, the Sekonic 358 meters, my, one of my favorite tools. Before we get started, just a couple of things. You can chat with us, <clears throat> and by all means, send your questions in. We'll take a couple of breaks through the presentation where we can actually answer your questions live. You see the chat sign-in window. Uh, give us a nickname so, so you can communicate with each other and with us. And then you'll see the chat window show up on the side of the screen. And that's how we'll communicate. So I'm sure you're going to have some questions. And I know in the past that you guys have helped each other out as well. So one thing I'm going to do before we get started is talk about this meter. This is a Conic 358. As I mentioned, it's one of my favorite tools. Now, out of the box, these meters come set to read in tenths of a stop. And that can be confusing to some folks. So what I'm going to do first is I'm going to set it to read in third stops because that's going to match exactly what we see on top of the camera. And if you uh, take a look on the back, Rick, if you go ahead and zoom in here, that's good. You see this little set of dip switches here. And what we want to make sure is that switches three and four are pushed up, as you can see in this graphic. That kind of makes it a little clearer. We want to see it in third steps. Go ahead, Jen. Let's see that graphic there. <clears throat> so here you can see full steps, half step. Full step means it will actually read in tenths of a stop. Half step would be half stops, which is kind of broad. And third steps or third stops is how your camera is set. So that makes a lot more sense, and it makes it easier to follow. You don't have to try to figure out, well, this is reading a tenth of a stop off. What do I need to do with my lights? So it just makes it easier. Now, this does have the Pocket Wizard uh, controller built into it. Uh, I'm going to use that with my little speed light. When I move up to the studio lights, we're going to use a different system. So I'm going to use the meter in a different way that you may not be familiar with. So I mentioned we're going to start small. And we're going to talk about doing portraits in a studio just using a speed light. And I'm just going to use a single speed light here. There's some advantages and some disadvantages to doing this. The advantages, well, you probably already own the speed light. You just need to spend $15 on an umbrella stand, uh, an umbrella mount, and a light stand. I've got a Pocket Wizard Plus 2 trigger uh, hooked up to a Pocket Wizard Caddy, which is really nice because it really makes it secure on any light stand. And then I've got a cable going up to the sink in my flash. If you have a flash that does not have a sink port, you can also buy these little uh, hot shoe adapters, which have sink ports in the front, and you can plug into there because not every flash has that sink port. But this entire system right here, the combination of the uh, pocket wizard, the umbrella mount, and the stand, probably looking at about $200 for the whole thing, coupled with your light. And you've got kind of a portable lighting. Now, I do use this setup a lot when we're at weddings. I don't use it for studio photography, but at weddings, I use it a lot. I don't use it there, though, because it's kind of a harsh light, as we're going to see in a second. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to position this light over here. And I'm going to invite our friend Susan out onto the set. Hi, Susan. Hey, Joe. Nice How's to it going? see you again. Good to see you. you guys have uh, met Susan before if you've watched any of our previous videos. And what we're going to do first is use just this single speed light to see what it can do. Now, I just wanted to show you bare light first because it's going to be kind of harsh, kind of directional. It's a very small head, so it ends up being a point light. And when you're dealing with a point light like that, it's going to make very hard transitions from light to shadow. So let me just get this off a little bit. And let's put the meter on transmit mode. So what this meter can do is, since it's got the pocket wizard transmitter in it, I can actually fire my flash right from the meter. So I just point back at the light. Now, since I'm only using one light, I want to meter back to the light, because that's the only light source. And I want to make sure it doesn't end up too hot coming back to Susan. So I get my reading. And oh, I'm at 400 ISO, by the way, because that's, that's important. Um, I get my reading, and I'm at F14, which is kind of high, but we're at 400 ISO. But there's a reason that I did that, because we're going to modify this light shortly, which is going to greatly change that. So let's go ahead and F14, and make sure everything's firing here. Turn everything on. And I just lost battery power on my lights. And let's see what we got. Okay, well, 
it's okay, but it's very harsh light. As you can see, um, there's not much shape around it. It's just kind of harsh. It really needs to be modified a little bit. So what can we do to make that happen? Actually, Rick, out of my bag, if you just grab me the second flesh or a set of double A's, either way. What we're going to do is modify it. What we've got here is a really nice little tool. This is from Creative Light. It's called the Softbox Umbrella. And these are really, I think, $53 we looked up this morning. And with this, basically, it's, a, it's an umbrella like you're used to seeing, except it has a big panel that turns it into a softbox really handy. And this is going to change that little front of that flash, that little tiny light source, into something much larger. And when you have a larger light source, what happens? It, yeah, it's going to spread the light a lot more. It's going to be a much softer light, and it's going to be a nice, much nicer spread across the light. So let me go ahead and pop this on here. All right. So let's get our flesh. Oh, and one other thing I wanted to show you before we get started. And I don't know how well you can see the back of the flash, but let's just take a look here. Your flash, when you first turn it on, defaults to ETTL. That's not what we want. We want to make sure that this is completely on manual. So I just hit the mode button until I see manual, and that's where we want to be. And I'm having the same problem with this one. I've got to put new batteries in here. Bear with me a second. I hate when that happens. And again, <laughs> just to bring that up, that's actually one of the problems when you're dealing with these flashes. As you can see, these are not very flexible. Once you start firing these up for a bit, they're going to die pretty quickly. So that is one of the limitations of dealing with these flashes. Oops. They don't last long. You're going to get a handful of flashes out of it, and then you're going to be done. So you do want to make sure that if you're going to do this seriously, make sure you get yourself an external battery pack. All right, so now we're set on manual, and I'm going to dial it down to quarter power. That's kind of a good starting point for dealing with the flashes. So I'm at a quarter power and manual on the flash. I've got my sync cable coming from my pocket wizard. And let me go ahead and re-meter. So let's just, che let's just check right here. And all right. So at 400 ISO, now we're up at F18. The reason, again, I'm at 400 ISO is because putting this softbox on here is going to greatly diminish the light. So let's go ahead and load that in. And when you do this, you want to make sure the flash is shooting into the box because that is what's going to make it soft. If I had it pointing back out, then you'd have a hot spot with a little bit extra light coming off on the side. So to do this, I'm just going to load it in. I'll turn it around so you can see. And this literally just slides over top of your light. Just tighten it down. And now I've got a portable big light that I can position wherever I want. And now that it's going through this soft box, it's going to soften the light, but it's going to cut down on it as well. And you can see where are we now. We went from F, what were we, F18 before to F8 now. And f is a good spot to be. So we're at F8. I'll set my camera on F8. And I simply point at Susan here, take my shot, and much nicer. I get a much nicer result. You can see the lights wrapping around somewhat better. However, it needs a little more. What I'm going to do is bring it a little bit closer. And I'm going to add one more element that you're going to want to use if you're going to use this kind of lighting situation. And that is a reflector. Now, one of the things about reflectors that people are curious about is <clears throat> there's, three si there's three types, typically, white, silver, and gold. I don't recommend the gold. They're way, way too yellow. Yeah. Whether to use white or silver depends on how much reflectivity you need. I like white with big studio lights, with a speed light, or outside, I'll typically go silver. And the other thing is, how close should your softbox be to your subject? Typically, it's going to be closer than you think. You want the softbox close, because that's what's going to create that wrap. If you have it way far away, 
And in essence, it becomes like a, a point light, almost like our little speed light by itself. So you got to be close. So since I'm closer now, I need to remeter. Another question I get asked all the time is dome in and dome out as far as the meters go. I'm dealing with a single light source. So in this case, it really doesn't matter if I'm in or out. Be consistent about it, however. The general rule of thumb is if you're measuring a directional light like we are, it's going to be dome in. I will use dome out later when I want to measure the sum of the lights we're using. So dome in, one more time, take a reading right back to Susan. And since we got a lot closer, yeah, what we at? We're at we were at the, the base 13. Well, now we're at F13 because we're a lot closer than we were. So I just dial an F13. And again, there's no way for your camera to figure this out. You've got to have a meter. It's just going to give you the exact amount of light that's going on to Susan. So let me just go ahead here and get my shot. And very nice. You can see, let's take a look at the result of that. You can see it's a much softer light. The reflector has caused the right side of Susan's hair. Now it has some nice light. It gives you a much nicer result. So we're going to do a little quick wardrobe change while Susan does that because I want to show you another tool for using this. So we've seen the softbox umbrella. I'm going to show you one of uh, other of my favorite tools. And this is called the Apollo. It's from Westcott. And it also folds down very small. It's got a nice silver inside, and it's a square softbox with some big baffles on either side, which allow you to make the light very directional, yet it folds down to nothing. And these are also fairly inexpensive systems. Uh, I think this set with the umbrella mount with the uh, adapter for the stand and the stand is about $125 or so, so they're very, very economical. And again, same thing. You want the light shooting in to the device so that it's going to take all this silver inside and reflect it back, and it's going to give you a nice, even light. So it simply just fits over top of the whole light system. I'll slide it into the stand. Easier said than done. There we go. And just like when we had the softbox umbrella, and I want to turn this around so you can see, so again, here's our entire setup. We've got the flash firing into it. It's on manual. We're on quarter power. The pocket wizard's in its caddy, connected with the sink cable. There's some zippers on the bottom to really keep the light reflecting in. And then the diffuser panel is Velcro. And the Velcro simply attaches to the side. And as I mentioned, the fact that it has these broad black wings is going to allow us to make this light very directional. This is a setup I use a lot for weddings. I will carry this as the, this is what I will use a lot of times when the bride's getting ready because it creates a very nice light, but it's really portable at the same time. So once again, I'll invite Susan out Oops, as I take the reflector down. And she has her stylish scarf with her. <laughs> so let's check our light again. And again, same setting. And what are we at? F8. We're at F8 at 400 ISO. So let's go ahead and dial in F8 again. All right, so we're at F8. All right, so now, direction and distance. So I'm going to put this at about 45 degrees, and we're about three feet from Susan. So let's see what this does. And not too bad, although we think the shadows are a little hard. We're going to need something to soften those up. So two ways to do that. I don't have the. I have a reflector here, but it's not pointing back at Susan yet. What I'm going to do is I'm going to change the direction of the softbox a little bit. I'm going to bring it around and a little bit closer, and that will fill in a little more of her face. So a little more head on, and come over here a little bit. There we go. And we have to remeter because we've changed position. So again, just right back at the light. And we're still at F8, so it didn't change. So let's go ahead and take our shot. Nice. And that's really nice. We're starting to get a nice result. We've got a little bit better. But we've still got a little bit of a shadow on this side that might be a bit too deep. And again, that's one of the slight weaknesses of dealing with a small speed light 
there's no modeling light. So you can't really see what light is showing up on her. I do have a modeling light of a big studio light here, but it's not really adding any light to the scene. Yes, it's true that a speed light can have a pseudo modeling light. It will do kind of a flickering thing for a second that really chews up your batteries. Probably not a good idea. So if you're going to use this kind of setup, it's going to take a little bit of practice of playing with it to see position and distance. So we've got this. I'm just going to change the direction a little more. I'm actually going to come in a little bit closer. So Susan, if you'd get in a little closer to the light box. And again, you might not be used to having your light source this close to the subject. But for a softbox to really wrap around, it's really what it needs. So since she's closer, I've got a different reading. What do we got? We're up to F11. F11. So let's set our camera at F11. And now she's closer in. Let's get the shot. And nice. Still, however, because even though this is nice, this is a 28-inch softbox, 28 inches for a softbox isn't really that huge. I would have to even come out around a little more to illuminate the other side of her. What I'm going to do instead is just add a reflector. So now you can see, even with just these studio lights, that we're starting to get a little bit more fill on this side of Susan by adding the reflector. Now I don't need to adjust my ISO because the main light, which is what we metered, hasn't changed. All we're going to do is now some of this light is going to hit the reflector and go back to Susan. So again, simply look a little bit towards more of the light. Look, look this way a little more. Turn your head a little more back to me. Nice. And nice. Now the difference is we've got the light reflecting off of her hair. So that really is a big help. All right. So we've seen an inexpensive way to get started. We just used our simple speed light with a soft, first a softbox umbrella, then with the softbox and a reflector. It's a good way to get started and fairly inexpensive. But if you're serious about doing portrait work, it's not going to cut it. It's a nice portable system for when you're out in the field. But if you're doing studio work and you keep firing, your batteries are going to die. And as the batteries start to die on these things, what's going to happen is your flash output's going to change and you're going to get inconsistent results. You have to shoot a little slower, but that's still not saying you can't get great results. But now we're going to go into studio lights. Before we do that, let's take a look at kind of a summary of what we've seen so far with the single light and the speed light, and then we'll be back and answer some questions. Okay, we're back. So before we get fired up, just got a couple of questions and thanks for these. Oh, this, people always love to hear about gear. So a couple of you asked about what lens am I shooting with. I'm shooting with a Canon 24 to 70 2.8. Uh, I generally shoot it closer to the 50 to 70 millimeters. I'm shooting on a 7D, so it does have that 1.6 multiplier. I don't like to go much closer in than 50 millimeters with this because when you go really wide, it has a tendency to distort features, and I don't like that. As far as dome in or dome out, let's kind of review that. When I'm dealing with directional light, like studio lights, I'm not measuring ambient, I will generally stick with dome in. You'll see when we get to multiple light setups, which we're going to do shortly, 
I'm going to put the dome out for my final reading. So I'll measure each light's contribution dome in because I don't want it to see the other lights. Then for my reading back to the camera, when I want a summary of all the light hitting the subject, then I'll come dome out. But good question. That, that's confusing to a lot of folks. Okay. Uh, somebody asked special, specifically about the Pocket Wizard Flex TT5. We're not using that today. Uh, we're using uh, we're using plus twos. We're just doing everything in manual. Stay tuned in the future. I will talk about automatic flash. Uh, someone asked about why did I choose one quarter power on my flash? Another good question. A little bit of experimentation from that. I know that my flash in a softbox at a quarter power at ISO 400 at about eight feet away is going to give me about F8, eight to 10 feet away. That's a thing you can simply test. Set up the system in a room that has dim lighting. Check your power settings. I know that outside, for example, that at uh, one quarter power in bright sunlight at 10 feet away at ISO 100, my flash gives me um, F8. But in a soft box, you lose several stops that way. So two stops up from 100 ISO is 400 ISO, and that allows me to get that F8, that is the goal that I was shooting for. Let's see. Somebody asked, can I show the metering process without pocket wizards? Stay tuned, that's coming up. Uh, as far as shutter speed I'm shooting, good question. All I need to really make sure I'm doing with my shutter speed is that it's at my flash sync speed or lower. Now I'm shooting at 160th of a second. If I shot at 100th or 125th or even a 60th of a second, my result's going to be exactly the same because there's not enough ambient light here to matter. All of my light is coming from the flash. The flash duration at the powers we're using is maybe about a thousandth of a second. So it, my shutter speed actually doesn't matter. I'd have to go down pretty low before I'd start picking up ambient light. Something I do do in a wedding. If I'm shooting a wedding, I might have my shutter speed at a 15th or a 30th of a second so that I get some of that background light. In a studio situation, though, the flashes are providing all the light. So I'll generally stay at 125th or 160th of a second. All right, let's see. Somebody asked, uh, how much does the meter cost if you're on a budget? Well, most of us are on budgets. In fact, probably most of you out there are on budgets. Uh, 358, I believe these, Rick, you could double check for me. I believe these are 309, something like that. So we figure $310. If you want to add the pocket wizard trigger inside it, that's another $75. So you're talking about $380 for one of these fully outfitted. Now, someone asked about uh, other radio triggers. Will they work with the meter? Yes, they will. In fact, I'm going to do a system uh, with these Profoto lights that actually uses a triggering system different than the Pocket Wizard. In fact, we're done with the Pocket Wizards for the day. So I will show you how to use the meter with any radio triggering system. And then the last question is, uh, I was asked, does the, uh, does the meter work with the Pocket Wizard Mini and Flexes? And the answer to that is yes. Uh, the Sekonic can go through the entire set of channels that those systems are capable of using. So yes, anything you're doing with any of those, and I will be doing a program in the future on the Mini and Flex, so stay tuned. All right, good set of questions. So let's continue on. It's time to bring in the big guns. We're going to go to the studio lights. So what I have here, Rick, if you'd zoom out a little bit or just come on over here, I've got a Profoto D1. This is a monolight. It's a self-contained system. And what it has built into it is something called the air system. This thing actually sits on top of my camera, and I can control my lights right from here. I can change the power. I can turn them up and down. I can turn them on and off individually. Uh, and I can trigger them from this. However, this thing by itself does not talk directly to the meter. So I need to use the meter in a different mode. Now, I, now let's see. Rick, see if you can zoom in on here. Let's just look at the front of the meter. All right, oh, nicely, nice up. Let me just get the glare out of there and check the focus. Okay, so if I hold in the mode button, as I spin the dial, you'll see different shot, different choices. So this first button, the first symbol is for, uh, you get too much, I mean, you need too much glare. The first symbol is for ambient light. The second symbol is where the flash, it's waiting for a flash to fire. So once I hit the read button, which is the black button on the side, it will wait 90 seconds to see a flash. So in this case, 
I would actually have to hit the meter, and this would work with any flash you have, whether it's fired manually or from some radio system. If I just come over here, push in the button on the side of the meter, point it at my light, it's now going to wait 90 seconds. I can then fire my flash from the top of the camera. There it goes, and it gives me a reading. That's a way that you can use this meter with any flash system, manual or automatic. You can even have someone else pop your flash for you. So since these lights are much more powerful than what we were dealing before, I'm going to come down to 100 ISO, which is generally where I prefer to be anyway. So let's get a reading. So I'm going to just kind of meter this one light. So again, I just simply pointed at the light. Since I'm using a single light again, pointed at the light, hit the test button, and I get F11. So that's my reading. So let's get Susan back here. Hi. Hi, welcome back. All right, so what we're going to do now is use a big softbox. Again, it also has kind of these wings. I'll bring them around a little bit. You can see it's recessed. The advantage that brings you is you can make a single light more directional. So let's start out by putting the light on both Susan and the background. Susan, step about a foot or two up. Yeah, right there about. That's good. So let me come about right here. And we're going to re-meter. So again, remember, this meter doesn't talk to this system. And if, you, if you guys have any other kind of radio triggers or manual triggers or whatever you're using, you can't meter, you can't pop it with this. This is only for pocket wizards. So I'll, I'll put Susan to work, point the meter at the light, hit the button, and it's going to wait 90 seconds. So I just pop the lights, and what do we got? We got F13, a little hot. I'm going to bring it down a little bit. And again, that's the beauty of this system. I can actually hold in the button, wait for the beep, and there we go. Let's re-meter again. And what do we have now? F10. I'm going to bring it down a little bit more. You can hear that little beeping going on. It's changing the power right from this unit. So hit the button. F9, that's good. All right, so we're at F9 at 100 ISO. So I just tell my camera 9 at 100 ISO. Before I go any further, however, this is a different set of lights. So there's two things I would do whenever I'm doing portrait lighting. One is custom white balance, and then the second would be have a custom camera profile shot ready. So I'm going to ask Susan to hold this, and I'm going to point it back at the camera. We've already metered. I'm going to do a custom white balance. Now, this is different in every camera, unfortunately. On Canons, what you do is you take a shot of the white card first. And you tell it, please use that for my custom white balance. So I just come in here, take my shot. Beautiful. I tell it to use that for my custom white balance. And it tells me, set it up on top of the camera to use the custom white balance. Then I will take a shot of the color checker passport. And later on in software, that will allow me to create a custom camera profile which is really going to dial in on my colors perfectly. I don't have to fill the frame with this. Just need to kind of be in the right place, and I'm good to go. So let me set this. We're going to have to re-meter. Since there's been some movement going on, so let me get rid of that. Let's get the meter in here. So one more time, Susan, I'm going to put you to work. Sure. So she's measuring right from underneath her chin towards the light. Again, we're dealing with one light. I've got the dome in because I'm measuring directional light. And we get our reading. And we're still at F9, so she didn't move that much. So F9, ISO 100. Remember, that's what we went to. And we take our first shot. And not too shabby. It's a good start. However, Kind of like when we saw with the speed light, what was happening? Contrast. Yeah, we're getting a little bit too much contrast because this light is very directional. And even though it's good at wrapping, the angle that I'm at, it can't wrap completely around the other side of her face. So first, simply what I'm going to do is change the light. I'm going to bring it around so it's a little more frontal on Susan. And just as a safety, in case I moved, put you to work one more time. I'm going to have her point at the light. And good thing we did because F10. it's at F10. So we went up a third of a stop because I moved the light a little closer to her. So let's go to F10. 
and let's see how we do now. And better. But I think we still need a little more fill. So we're going to bring our friend the reflector back in. So let's get our reflectors. And now you can see what's really nice, since this soft box has a really big modeling light in it, you get to see the effect of the reflector as it's happening. So I've kind of got my light coming in. Let me change my reflectors so I get light where I want it. And I'll point this kind of right at the reflector. That's, and I can see just looking at her, that's already going to be nice. So again, we've changed the light a little bit. One more time. Sure. Right under, under her chin, pointing back. And we're at F9. So F9, get my shot, and very nice. Now you can see we've got some light on the back of her hair. The light's wrapped around. Plus, since this is a big softbox, it's also illuminating the background a little bit. And one of the beauties of having a softbox is you can change the tone of the image by its position a lot. Now, I'm going to show you something else that I love. And let's see, I'm going to switch around to the other side. Let me get my reflector out of the way. Susan, I'll put you to work. If you sure. grab the reflector and bring it around the other side. Sure. All right. OK. Now, this is a lighting that I really love. And I, I won't say I stole it. I actually learned this from Jack Resnicki, so I always give Jack credit when I show this. This is a light that I would have never thought to do by myself. And what I did, I'm going to go through the process so you can see the images. But what I did was I processed them ahead of time. We shot these earlier because I find that this effect works really well in black and white. This really creates a beautiful black and white image. So I'm going to have Susan get really close. And this is one of those times where you absolutely have to have a meter. So Susan, get right, right there. So again, she's what? What is that? 10 inches, sure. 8 inches, right from the front of the softbox. And somebody asked, why not? Why use a meter to do this? Well, if, <laughs> if I had somebody this close to the softbox, I'm going to be guessing. I'm going to be going up and down. I'm going to be trying to rely on the histogram and the camera, which you ca absolutely cannot do in this situation because it's got hot, bright light, and very dark backgrounds. It's going to be all over the place. If you want to be professional, you want to get it in the first time. The other thing is, this light's going to be right in front of her face. If I started having to pop this off 10 times to finally get the correct exposure for this image, I'm going to have a blind model. <laughs> Even when they're this close, I'll ask her first to go ahead and close her eyes. But look right at the light. Actually, I'll, I'll do it from here. I'll do it. You just close your eyes. I don't want you to get blinded. And now I'm at F14, which is fine. But I just needed to know that. So. I'm going to ask Susan to kind of look kind of right at the front of the softbox right here and go to F14 on my camera. And let's see what we get. And beautiful. Take a look at that. Isn't that nice? Take a look at how soft that is. It really creates a beautiful image. And as I mentioned, I did process this earlier into black and white. Now, I'm going to do one other thing. When you're playing with this, this whole situation, if you want to try this softbox really close, you can move your subject up and back this way. So if, as Susan comes closer to the front of the softbox, it's going to create more of a rim light and leave this side of her face more in shadow, which again can create a really cool effect. So I'm just going to re-meter. Close your eyes, hon. OK, I'm at F11 now. So let me set my camera on F11. Because she's moved out of the light somewhat, but now it's going to now it's going to illuminate the far side of her, add some light to her hair, and on this side it's going to be a little more in shadow. So let's take a look at that. Look right over here. Actually, a little more this way. Good, right there. Nice. And we get a really beautiful result. And again, I made this black and white ahead of time because this is really a nice effect. Again, you really want to have a meter to do this because if not, you're going to be torturing your, your model, your customer, your client, 
and uh, you don't want to do that. So this has all been with one light. Now it's time, what do you think? It's time to bring in a second light. So we're going to move some lights around. So I'm going to put Susan to work again. Sure. So I'm going to grab this. If you'd grab the uh, fill light, sure. the, the strip box. So now what we're going to do is we're going to introduce our second light. Okay, so now we've got a two light set. I've still got my three foot by four foot soft box here. And right over here is a light I really like to use as a fill. This is a one foot by four foot soft box. It's a very controlled soft lighting and really creates a nice kind of rim light onto one side to fill in shadows. So what I'm gonna do is, let's see, I'm gonna kind of get Susan right in the middle and I'm gonna measure the contribution of each light individually. So first I wanna get the reading from my main. I'll go ahead and I'll take care of it. <laughs> and I'm at F9. Then I'm going to come in between the main and the meter. Again, the dome is in, so it doesn't read this big light behind me. I just want to measure this. Actually, let me back this off a little bit. So I'm going to measure the contribution of the rim light, and it's F8. Well, that's not enough of a difference. I've got F9, F8. I want to have at least a stop apart. So I'm going to bring this one down. And again, the beauty of this system is I can do it right from here. Just wait for the beep. So I'll take one more reading. And 5.6. Five, five, I want it down exactly one stop. That's the beauty of this. This uh, controller, if you hit the button once, it drops it down one tenth of a stop. If you hold it in, it goes down one full stop. So if you don't have a lot of assistance running around, <laughs> this will uh, take control of that. Or if you don't have a customer who's also a photographer, who you can put the work on the set. <laughs> So we've got F9 and 5.6 on the fill. Now I'm going to take a dome up reading back to the camera because this is going to give us a reading. So I'll ask, I'll put you to work again. So I'm going to ask Susan to read that. We're going to get a reading right back to the camera position of a sum of all of our lights. And I'm getting 7.1. Let's just do that again. And it's consistent. I'm getting 7.1 with this new light setup. Beautiful. So I just go to 7.1 on my camera. And again, I hope what you're seeing is the fact that I use the meter, I get the exact correct exposure every time. I don't have to guess. I don't have to chip. I don't have to judge by the back of the camera, which, by the way, I would never trust the exposure on here. Some of you might say, I'm going to use the histogram. Well, that's all well and fine, too. But we've got a dark background here. The histogram is going to be all pushed to the left. Not a good way to judge your images by what you see on the back of the camera. Trust the meter. It's going to be perfect. So I have a nice light wrapping around Susan. I've got a rim light on the other side. Let's see what we get. And we get really nice results. Nice kind of even light. You see nice catch lights in the eye. And with the rim light off to the side, the side of her head is getting nicely illuminated. So let's take a look at a couple more images that we just shot. Again, the beauty of it is that you get to shoot quickly with these studio lights. They recycle very quickly, and you're going to see your results right away, and you're not going to have that variation. Now let's change the lighting around a little bit. Let's get a little more dramatic, and we're going to do that simply by moving our main light. Now you stay here. Okay. So what I'm going to do is move the main light off to the side more. And you might think this is just going to cause kind of a split lighting on Susan, but not really. So you come in right about here. Now, even though the light is pointing actually at me, kind of in front of Susan, it's actually going to illuminate her just fine. Actually, where's our chair? We're going to give Susan a break. Let's bring a chair in. You have a seat. Okay. So I've got our main light, and now it's pointing this way. Why? You would think I'm losing all the light. Well, if you look inside one of these and kind of take off the, uh, the covering, you'll see the inside is reflective. This is not my only light source. These big panels on the inside are also a light source, and they're reflective as well. So this is called feathering. I'm getting light on here, but this inside panel is also coming back towards Susan. So it's still going to illuminate her. The difference is going to be, now my dark ground is going to go backer, blacker, darker rather, 
because I've changed the direction. Now the softbox is illuminating her and just a little bit of the background. So we need to re-meter because we changed the position and the distance of our lights. So I'll throw dome in. I'll do it. <laughs> dome in. Again, I'm doing directional. And I get F9. We'll do the same thing over here. And I'm getting 4-5. Four, 4-5 five. Four, five to 9. Yeah, that's good. I like that. It's a nice ratio. Uh, it's going to be about a 4 to 1, I guess. My math not going to be perfect, but that's going to give us a nice shot. Still shadow on here. We have a little bit of light splashing on the background, but it's falling off differently, so it's going to end up a little darker. And the last thing I want to do is do a dome up reading back to the camera position to get my actual reading, and we're still at 7-1. So, good to go. So let's go on 7-1, which is where we were, and we'll take a shot like this. And nice. You see we've got a little bit of, there's a very slight bit of what you might call split lighting. You can see we've got a bright on this side of her face, less bright here, with a slight shadow down the uh, left side of the middle of Susan's face. It kind of creates a nice look. I'm going to just adjust this around a little bit more. I'm going to bring this light forward a little more, which is going to feather a little more. Now it can see around to this side of her face a little better. I'll put you to work one more time. So again, dome in to measure the directional light. So go ahead and point at that light. And what do we got? F8. Point at the side light. 4, 5. That's good. And a dome up back to the camera position. Now again, we've changed this light, so there's going to be a little more spill. I'm going to guess we're going to go to F8. Let's see. Ah, oh, I was wrong. <laughs> Again, it went down to 6.3 because I did lose some of the intensity, but that's the information that this gives me. If I stayed where I was, I would have ended up a little bit underexposed, which is not good. Trust your meter. It won't lie. So I go to 6.3, and beautiful. And the difference is, is that nice? Yeah. The difference is now... The background has gone a little bit darker because the light is more directional to this point and it's not illuminating the background. All right, we've got our main light, we had our fill. That's one way to use these. Let's change things around. I'm going to get rid of the fill light. Actually, I'm going to ask you to hold the camera. I'm going to get rid of the fill and we're going to put a background light up. All right, so. I have my background light over here. Now, my background light is, again, it's another Profoto D1. And what we've done to add a little interest to it is we put a blue gel in front of it. I don't know how well you see that on video, but you'll see in just a second that this is blue. And I'm going to put this just on the background. I'm going to have it right illuminating behind Susan. And the first thing I'm going to do is just take a shot just of the background light. So to, what I'm going to do is, from the controller, I'm going to turn off the main light. So all right, that one's off. Now the only thing on is the background light. So let me get a meter reading for just that. And I'm getting 4.5. And our light was 6.3, although we're going to move it around. So we're going to be about 7.1. So this is going to be about a stop and a half underneath our main light, which is probably a good starting point. So before I do that, though, I'm going to take a shot just of the background light at that 4 or 5 setting, just so you can see what contribution it's doing. So let me go ahead and take that. And you can see we have a nice, just a background. The blue is being cast. It's adding some nice shape. We just have a plain gray background. By adding some gels to your background light, really can uh, vary your sets very inexpensively. In fact, what you can also do is put things like grids in front of that. Yeah. You could make like window shade or uh, shades actually for your windows to actually create those lines across the background. So we've got our main light back on. Let me change the direction a bit. I'm going to put this a little forward. And what do I have to do? I got to remeter. Do it? Yes. And what did we get? 7-1. We're right back to where we were. 
Now again, the backlight, if you remember, was four or five, and it's not making a contribution to our exposure. It's just illuminating the background. So all I'm concerned about exposure-wise is this light. I can do a forward reading, if you go ahead and hold it under your sure. nose, with the dome up. But again, since it's a single light, we're going to get pretty much the same result. It went down a third of a stop. I've got 6.3, so let's go ahead and dial that in. And 6.3 with our background light and our main. And nice. And you can see we've got a nice, really nice effect. Again, we're just dealing with two lights. I can also help with my two lights set. Let's say that's all I own. What else can I use? Reflector. Reflector. Let's grab a reflector. So I'm going to bring the reflector around. And one of the things when you're angling your reflector, remember, kind of like when you're playing pool, the light is going to bounce. Um, Remember incident angles and all that stuff? Too much math, huh? <laughs> Just remember, it's going to bounce off at the same angle, the opposite angle that it hits at. But again, having this nice big softbox modeling light, I get to see the effect right here. I'm going to actually bring this over a little bit front. And as I move this around, actually, I'm not sure how well you see it on video, but watch the, the side of Susan's face. You can see the light changing. And I kind of like it about right there. That's a good spot. All right, so let's just see if our reflector changed our setting at all. Right back to the camera. And nope, we're still at 6.3, so that's good. So now I get my shot. Zoom in a little bit. And gorgeous. Oh, well, that's really nice. Isn't that pretty? That's beautiful. Gorgeous. Really nice result. And again, how many exposures did it take me testing to get it right? One. One. <laughs> One meter, one meter reading, that's it, it's perfect. So I'm gonna just bring this up a little more, even a little closer. And again, I don't know how well you see it on video, but coming up a little closer now, it's adding a little bit more fill light, again, back onto the front of Susan's face. It's softening the shadows a little more. So if you would give me a reading, I'll get out of the way. And we're still at 6.3. So it wasn't enough to cause a stop change, but even just with my eyes, I can see that the shadows on her face have softened a little bit. So let's go ahead and get that. And beautiful. So the difference is, now when you look at her arm that's closer to the reflector, it's filled in a little bit. It's made this light very soft. It's really created a nice wraparound. This is two lights, our background light, our main, and a reflector. So we've seen a whole bunch of things you can do with just one or two lights. And you can really do some nice professional portraits with that. So we're going to do a quick set change. In the meantime, take a look at this summary of our one and two light sets. When we come back, we'll take some more questions, and then we'll move on to three lights. Okay, we're back on the set, and again, a couple of good questions. So, the question is, why meter to the light and not to the camera before the shot? Good question. The reason I meter to the light when I'm dealing with a single light is that is my only light source. And if I'm doing a single light source like that, 
What I'm after is I'm really after the side that's closest to the light to be perfectly exposed. I'm kind of going for that dramatic effect typically where I want this side to be more in shadow. If that's the case, I want that number. I want the number that's coming off the light that's illuminating the face because I want this side to be perfect. If I meter back to the camera, it's going to give me an average. It's going to make this a little hot for that particular look I'm going for. Understand that some of this stuff is somewhat subjective. I'm showing you guys my way of doing things, but I've had a lot of years doing this, and I really find that if I'm dealing with a single light set, I will meter back to that main light. Uh, another question was, why wouldn't I just use the sync speed for the camera? That's going to vary from camera to camera. Some are 125, some are 1 250th. Um, it doesn't really matter. As long as you're at the, whatever your camera's sync speed is or lower, the result's going to be the same because, again, there's practically no ambient light here to register. All my light's coming from the flash. Again, my flash sync is at a thousandth of a second. Uh, one of the reasons I will generally come down from the sync speed a little bit is the cameras get a little finicky sometimes. And sometimes you can have a little bit of a problem when you're right at the sync speed where you start to lose a little light. The timing can get off on certain cameras. So I like to bring it down a little bit from that top sync speed. Uh, another question was, how did I get the Sekonic to wait uh, for 90 seconds? And that's just built into the meter. If I bring my meter up, um, again, we can't see close that closely on the meter with all the little settings. The first setting is for ambient light, meter, light metering. The second one is wait. It's looking for a flash. So as soon as I put it on the second icon and hit the measure button, the flash will then wait for 90 seconds, or the meter rather, will wait for 90 seconds to see a flash. That's just built in. It's how they work. Uh, the third mode is a corded mode where you actually plug your sync cable into here and actually fire the flash from the, uh, from the meter. I don't typically do that. I like the 90 second thing. And then the last setting is wireless triggering mode, which works if you happen to have the Seconic uh, wireless pocket wizard transmitter in your meter. So that 90 second wait period is built into the meter. They all do that. Uh, another question was, somebody asked, is, uh, isn't, shooting, isn't the umbrella softbox about the same as shooting through an umbrella if you happen to have a shoot through umbrella? They are very similar, but there's a couple of differences though. Since the softbox umbrella has that black outside, it has a tendency to make the light a little bit more directional. When you're shooting through an umbrella, you're shooting through a curved surface. So that has a tendency to send the light out in all directions. Since the umbrella softbox has a flat front, it's a little more uniform light, and it's a little more wrapping than shooting through an umbrella. But you can use that as well. Um, someone asked how I use the color checker to balance the color. Subject for another day, uh, but that's the color checker passport. Go on the X-Rite site. There's all kinds of info on that. Uh, the lens I use for portraits. Depends on the setting, depends on the camera, depends on the studio. Probably my favorite lens for portrait shooting, if I have a big enough studio, is a 70 to 200. I'm shooting with a 7D today, however, which is not a full frame camera. It adds that multiplying effect. So I'm shooting with a 24 to 70. And at 70, 50 to 70 millimeters, it's giving me a nice short telephoto, which makes the features compress a little bit, makes it very attractive, yet allows me to work closer in a smaller studio. Let's see. Uh, so some, oh, somebody asked, <laughs> how do you know if your light meter is equipped to work with a pocket wizard? Uh, somebody was given a pocket wizard, or a Seconic 758 as a gift. Lucky you. 758 is the Rolls Royce of light meters. Uh, all 758s have the pocket wizard triggering built into them. So yes, you do have that. Uh, let's see. Uh, someone asked, "Is what if I use a fill that's exactly the same size as the main, but dialed down? Absolutely. There's nothing wrong with doing that. You can certainly do that. Uh, the reason I like the strip box is it gives me a little more control as far as the positioning of the lights goes. But there are times when I've used two three by four foot soft boxes or even a four foot by six foot soft box as a main and fill. So yes, you can certainly dial it down. It all has to do with the control and the directionality of the light you want. Uh, let's see. Someone asked about the pricing of a complete D1 air kit. I'll get the, when we take the second break. I'll get back to you. I don't know off the top of my head. Um, and then someone asked, "What is the pocket wizard that was on the camera?" What you just saw was not a pocket wizard. That was the air controller for the Profoto D1 lights uh, that I was using to control the lights. That wasn't a pocket wizard system. Um, pocket wizard does have that ability uh, with one of their systems called the AC3. Subject for another day. So stay tuned. I will get to that. All right. It's time to move on to three lights.
I've still got my main, that's always gonna be here. Again, it's a three foot by four foot soft box. What I'm gonna bring in is a hair light. And what the hair light's gonna allow me to do is just to put a little bit of a sheen, not on my hair, you don't wanna see pictures of me. We're gonna bring Susan back onto the set. And by having that little bit of light, it adds an extra dimensionality and separates your subject out from the background. It really makes it look more three dimensional. So let's get Susan back on the set and do that. Hi, Susan. Hey. So since Susan's been standing all day, or we got, we got some uh, nice apple crates for her, and uh, we're going to bring in a hair light. So what I've got for my hair light, I don't know how well you can see this, because yes, I understand the set's dark. I apologize for that. But I've got, a, again, a, a Profoto D1 mono light here with a, uh, a zoom lens on it that is going to be my hair light. You can use snoots, you can use barn doors, you can use whatever it is you have available to do that. We happen to have this in the studio, so I grabbed it. So I'm going to fire this light on, and I'm going to really just point it right at the top of Susan's head here. The reason I like this lens is it is extremely directional, so it will really keep things down close. So let me grab my camera. I'm going to need that. And again, for those of you that ask, this thing on top of my camera, this is not a pocket wizard. This is the controller for the air system. So we've added another light. So I'm going to put the dome in because I want to see what the hair light does. So let me just get a meter reading off of that. And I'm getting F9 off the hair light and F8 off my main light. So that means my hair light's a third of a stop hotter than my main. I generally don't want to do that. Because Susan's hair has some shine to it, chances are it could really cause a slight bit of blowout if I go above the main. So I'm going to dial that one down a little bit. I put my hair light on D. And I'm going to bring that down a stop. There it goes. So let's take another meter reading. And now I'm at 6.3. Six, six, three. So I went from 9 to 6.3, exactly one stop which is now it's two-thirds of a stop underneath my main. So how do you figure out what exposure you want for your hair light? Depends on the, the subject's hair color. If Susan had raven black hair that wasn't really shiny, then I might go as much as a full stop over my main, or at least be at my main. Her hair is kind of a, a mid to dark brown, so it's a little bit lighter. I'm going to come two-thirds of a stop under. If she had blonde hair, I would bring it down even further, a full stop under maybe even a little more because you don't want to have such glare that it's blowing out the hair. So I've got a mane, I've got my hair light. Let's see just the hair light contribution. So what I'm going to do is turn off my other lights. I'm going to turn off my mane. I'm going to turn off my background. And all I've got left is the hair light. So let's see what that is. And our hair light contribution, remember, was 6.3. So I've got my camera at 6.3. And we're just going to see just what the hair light does. And there you see it. We've got just the hair. You can see nothing has gone really absolutely blown out, which is a nice thing. So we can tell that that's going to be a good hair light. So let's bring our other lights back online. Let's bring the master back on. And at this time, we're going to use a hair, the master, and the fill. So I'm going to put the fill light back on. So this is going to be a relative, relatively flat lighting. It's not going to be a lot of contrast. I've got the fill on this side. I've got a mane, and I've got a hair. So it'll be like we saw before. The difference is we're adding the hair light in. So we do need to meter our lights again. And once again, I'm going to go dome in. So Susan, if you do the honors. No so our mane is nothing. <laughs> Hit the button again. Sorry. F8. F8. All right. So let's meter the, uh, the fill light. F4.5. 4.5 to F8. So what's that? That's one and two thirds stops. That's got to be a little more contrasting than I want for this first go round. So I'm going to bring that up a bit. And let's try again. Five, Five six. One stop. Good. And we have our hair light, which was at 6.3. We already know our mains at, at 8. So let's do a meter our dome out reading back to the camera position. So again, this is going to be our average of all the lights. I want to get out of the way. 
to make sure I'm not affecting the lights, and I get an overall reading of 7-1. Seven seven so let's put 7-1 into our camera and do our shot. Nice. And Gorgeous. nice. Get great results. Nice, even light, but we, now we've got the difference we see from what we saw before. So we've got a nice hair light that's separating out the background a little more. Let's change direction a little bit. Let's get you straight up and down. Let's, yeah, let's turn you that way a little bit. Good. Let's try that. Just a little different direction. None of the lights have changed, though, so I don't need to remeter. Nice. Good. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to bring this around a little bit to lighten up the background. But I didn't change the distance, so nothing changed. And that's nice. So we get a nice result. Now, I'm going to move the hair light around a little bit. I want to get a little bit, actually, I'm going to cast a little hair light on your arms as well to add a little more shape. So I'm going to bring the hair light around so that it's now seeing. I know you can't see the hair light, but what I did was I brought it around the front a little more so that not only is it illuminating her hair, it's actually catching a little bit of this side of her arm and this side of her shoulder. So it's directional, illuminating this side of her head, this side of her shoulder, a little bit of this arm. So let's turn off the other lights again. We're just going to shoot the hair light just so you can see what the contribution of the hair light is. I'll go ahead and meter the hair light again since I did move it. I'm going to guess it's still going to be around 6'3 because we didn't move it that far. Oh, I was wrong. It's 5'0. I want to bring it up. That's a little bit too down from our F8 or F71. So let me bring that up. Four little squeaks there. Let's see what we get. Look at that. 6'3. Six, six, three. All right. So let's see this the hair light contribution now with the hair light brought around the front a little more. And good. So now we've got the hair. We've got a little bit of her front arm, a little bit of her back arm. Let's add our other lights back into the mix. So again, again, that's the beauty of this. I can just turn them on from here. Love it. All right, so everybody's back on. What I'm going to do is I'm going to make the light a little more directional again. I'm going to leave the fill light where it is. I'm going to bring the main light around a little bit because I want to create a little bit more of a deeper shadow on the background. So let me just bring this around. So I'm now feathering this light so that it's going to illuminate Susan, but now the background's going to go a little darker. So let's go ahead and get our average reading back towards the camera. If you would do the honors, I'll get out of the way. And we've got 6-3. I'm going to bring up my main a little bit. I want to go probably two-thirds of a stop up. Four, five, six should do it. Let's try that. Seven, one. I was off by one. One more time. There we go, F8. So now I'm at F8. So we've got our main casting light here. We're going to darken off this background over here a little bit more. I've got the fill also directional, illuminating this side. And I've got the hair light that's adding light to the side of her head, a little bit of shoulder, a little bit of this arm. So bring this arm out a little bit. Okay. There we go. And I'm at F8, because that's what our meter told us. And we trust our meter. Bring your sh this shoulder up a little bit, right there, down, but down, and rotate around. There we go. Nice. Beautiful. And nice results. So now what we've done by changing the directionality of this main light, it's caused a little bit of the background to darken. So you can change how your background is going to be affected by the angle of this main light. All right, now it's time to bring our blue light friend back. So now our three lights are going to be our main, our hair light, and our background light. So let me get rid of this fill light. And we're going to bring our blue background light back into the fray. And all right, so 
Now we've got our blue background light right where we left it. I'm going to go ahead and once again turn off the other lights because now I just want to check the contribution of the hair of the background light rather. So let me get the other lights off. All right, so everything is off now except for the background. Let's go ahead and get a meter reading off of that. And I'm getting 4.5. We were shooting at f8. That's a little bit low, so let's bring that up a bit. Uh, let's see, four, five. Let's go like the five, six. Yeah, a little more. Yeah. One more. All right, there we go. Okay, now we're at five, six. All right, so we've got our background light. Let me just show you what that contribution is. So we just have the blue on the background. So we're gonna see Susan in shadow against the background light. And kind of cool. Yeah. So we, there's our backlight contribution. And now we wanna bring our main and our hair light back into play. So we've got our main, so our main light comes back on. I want to bring the hair light back in too. So let me bring that in. Our hair light's right where we left it. Shouldn't have to re-meter for it. I'm going to bring the direction of this around a little. And let's get our reading. Now the only light that's really adding to the scene at this point is what? Our main light. I've got a hair light, which is just a fine point, and the background light. So I want to measure the directional light. So let's go ahead and dome in and point at the main light. And we have F9, because F9, we moved it a little closer. That's fine. So I go to F9. And what's going to happen? It's going to be gorgeous. Yes, of course. The exposure is going to be perfect because the meter can't be fooled. Let's rotate around the other way. Bring your back shoulder towards me a little right there. That, not quite that much. Right there. Gorgeous. Rotate around. That's it. Chin down. And I'm going to shoot down on you a little bit. Bring that down. Chin down and give me those eyes. There we go. <laughs> All right. Gorgeous. I hope you guys are seeing how easy this is. This is a lot of fun because once you get this under control, you don't have to worry about the technical stuff getting in the way. There's a lot more creative things we can do with lights. And yes, stay tuned. That will be coming in the future. We're going to do some really fancy light setups with some cool light modifiers. What today is about, though, is to get you under control so that you know what your lights are going to do. Now, one last thing I'm going to do with our three lights set, again, main, hair light, background light. In order to soften the shadows a little bit, I'm going to bring our friend the reflector back in. In a studio situation, it's really nice to have an assistant here. <laughs> Since Susan's a photographer also, she can assist. So I'm going to bring this down. And again, with the, since I've got a nice modeling light on here, I get to see the effect the reflector has. And what it's going to do is it's going to lighten up this side of her shoulder and this side of her hair a little bit more. The reflector may change our exposure a bit since it's pretty big. So we're going to go dome out back to the camera position. And what do we got? F8. All right. So we go to F8 and square off a little to me. Nice. Beautiful. All right. She's got it down. <laughs> I tell you, she's going to give up this photography gig and stay on the side of the camera. Beautiful results. You can see the reflector. What it's done is it's just filled in a little bit of the more deep shadows. I'm going to change things up a little bit just to tr try something a little bit funky. I'm going to move the reflector. Just out of curiosity, I'm going to bring my background light up and actually let the blue light skim off the back of her shoulder. And the only reason I'm thinking that is I'm looking at the color of her top and it may complement it. It may look awful, but I don't know. Let's take a look. All right, so now I've got our background light up a little bit. It's actually going to add a little bit of a contribution. Let's take a look and see what happens. I'm 
not sure if I like it or not. What do you think? It's all right. It's all right. This could be interesting. Maybe a blue gel isn't the answer. Maybe he used a yellow or a red gel. That would add some warmth and add even a little bit of extra color. So I'm going to put my background light closer to the background again. Again, this time just so it's illuminating Susan. I'm going to soften the shadows by bringing my main light a little more around front. So it is going to cast on the background. It's going to lighten the background a bit, but I'm more concerned about her. I've got my hair light still. Let me adjust that if you would hold that a second. I'm going to adjust my hair light so it is hitting more the back of her head. Kind of this spot right here. That's what I'm going for. So let's measure each of our lights individually. So dome in. Okay. And let's get the hair light first. Now when you're doing a hair light, sometimes you want to mask. Actually put your hand in between it and the main. Okay. All right. Okay. So let's see what we got there. So we got F8 on the hair. Let's measure the main. You don't have to shade for the main. F10. F10. Do it right under your chin. Mm -hmm. F9. And this is just doing the background, so I'm not concerned about it. So we've got F9 and F8. So the main is a third of a stop hotter than the hair light, which should be good, because her hair is fairly dark. So I go to F9. So we've got our hair light, our main wrapping around a little more. It's going to illuminate a little of the background. And then we have our blue gelled backlight that's going to add some color. And that's nice. That's a nice, nice set of images. And one more thing, again, what I can do is bring the reflector back. Again, an inexpensive way to almost be adding another light. I'm going to bring this in, just kind of, as I rotate it, I can see what effect it's having on Susan, mostly on her hair in this case. It's lightening up her hair on this side, which looks nice. So let me, since I got the reflector again, let me take a meter reading back to the camera, since I now have this acting as a second light. And we're still at F9, right where we left off. So F9, let's see what this does. Oh, that's nice. Little head, head towards me a little bit. Nice, right there. Beautiful. Yeah, that's nice. Main, hair light, background light, reflector. Three lights set that's really giving you a nice combination. Could you add more lights? Sure. <laughs> you can add 12 lights. It's going to get expensive, though. This is an inexpensive way to really get a lot of control out of your portraits. And as I said, there's a lot more fun stuff we can do with light shaping tools, which again, we'll do in the future. But I wanted you guys to get an understanding of kind of how to control the light so that you can then make your creative decisions. Now, I have a new, uh, new seminar that's coming up before I get to that. Let's take a look kind of at a summary of all the images for that we've just shot with the three lights. Enjoy. good questions again so all right I didn't go into detail on this today uh, and this is something you guys should school yourself on a little bit uh, question is what flash percentage is equal to one stop uh, this person has a 308 it doesn't have percentages good question it pays to learn a little bit about f-stops if you're going to be serious about this now there is another mode on this flash that I did not go into today where it will just tell you the difference between lights in stops without actually uh, concerning you with the actual numbers. But it's important to know that 
uh, each of your main uh, differentiators there are one stop apart. F4 to 5, 6 is one stop. 5, 6 to 8 is one stop. 8 to 11 is one stop. What does a stop mean? Well, if I've got F8 of light coming out of my main and 5, 6 coming out of my fill, that's one stop apart. A stop is a half. So that means my F8 light is putting out twice as much light as my 5, 6 fill. I can go into this another day in a little more detail. I'll do a little f-stop class, but it's kind of important to know what the difference in the f-stops is. Just understand that each full f-stop, 5, 6 to 8 to 11 to 16, is a doubling or a halving of the light. So again, f8 is twice as much light as 5, 6. f11 is twice as much light as f8. So it does pay to learn that. If you get that under control, believe me, it makes life a lot easier. Uh, let's see. Uh, somebody asked about the ambient light percentage feature on this. They asked me if I could explain that. That was last session. Uh, the, today was studio lighting. If you missed our last session, go back on Siconic.com. You'll see session two was about ambient light, and that uh, the major part of that session was how to measure the percentage of flash to ambient light, and I did go over that in detail. Um, I know a lot of folks missed that. I know it's summertime, and a lot of people are on vacation. So all of these are being recorded. They'll all live on Sakonic.com when we're done. And you can go back and review that. But I do go into that in detail. Uh, it's a good question, though. Uh, another question was somebody asked what the watt second outputs of the Profoto D1s I'm using are. Um, I believe these are 500s. Um, they come in different flavors. Uh, actually, the bigger numbers, although they do give you more power, they also give you finer increments or a greater range. Uh, but I find the 500s are a nice compromise as far as price and performance goes. Um, and as oh, good question. How far is the model from the background? I would say we're about six feet. Uh, it's enough that she's not casting a shadow on the background, but it's close enough that I can use my main light to illuminate both the background and the model should I choose. But good question. And then lastly, someone asked, can I use a 758DR? in place of the 358. Funny you should ask. Look what I have here. This is a Sakonic 758DR. This is the top of the line. It's got lots of bells and whistles, does everything that we just saw with the 358. In addition, it's got a lot of other features. It also has a spot meter, which is going to play heavily in our next session. And it has the ability, with a software, to actually calibrate the meter to your camera. It'll actually read in exactly how your camera sensor is performing, and you'll know exactly the tonal range of your camera on this meter. It's, it's a fairly involved system, but I will be going over this at the beginning of our next session because, funny that you should give me that segue into it, our next session is going to be on Wednesday, September 21st. I'll be doing covering one of my real passions, landscape photography. And we're going to a great spot to film most of these segments. We're going to Grand Teton National Park in Jackson, Wyoming. We're going to cover both landscape and some wildlife photography. We're going to use the Sakonic 758 because it has spot metering capabilities. And spot metering is going to be a great help for us when we decide that one exposure is not going to be enough. When we really decide that we need to have multiple exposures, and that's where the HDR photography is going to come in. Uh, and for those of you not familiar with it, HDR photography is when we're going to combine multiple exposures so that the entire tonal range of the scene is captured. The Sakonic 758 is a great tool that will allow you to do that uh, because of its spot metering and, and uh, incident metering abilities combined into one. That combined with its ability to actually program your camera so that your meter knows exactly what your camera is doing, it will show you exactly where your exposure lies and if you have any issues with under overexposure. So it's, it's a great tool. But Wednesday, October, or September 21st, we'll be back. Should be a lot of fun. For any of you landscape nature shooters out there, uh, join us on that. We're going to have a lot of great scenes to shoot uh, in beautiful settings in the Tetons, and maybe we'll even make it up to Southern Yellowstone as well. So, wow, I'm out of time. I actually went over a little bit. Thank you guys for staying with me. If you missed it, if you came in late, or those of you had to leave early, this has been recorded. It will show up on Sakonic.com shortly. Uh, but until then, let's take a uh, quick review of everything that we've seen today. And, oh, by the way, I forgot to put it up here. Uh, we added a answer section. 
Uh, if somebody had a question that I just was unable to get to, maybe it was a little too detailed, maybe it was beyond the scope of today's program. But if you send an email, I believe it's askjoe at Sakonic.com. Uh, easy to remember. So if you do at, send me an email at askjoe at Sakonic.com, I will get it. I'll do my best to get you an answer as soon as possible. So until next time, thanks for your great questions. Thanks for spending the, the uh, hour with us. And take a look at our summary of today, and we'll see you in a couple of weeks. Thanks, everyone. Thank you.